Thank you so much. Well, this half an hour has just flown by. We're so excited to have participated in the 30-hour day project. want to thank everyone here in Portland for having us. And uh, we're going to close our set with the song we close every set with. It's uh, one of my favorites, again, from an American musical. Not a very popular one, but you didn't know that. And uh, we've given our own sort of a Carnival Cruise commercial feel. So uh, we're going to take you out today with a lot of living to do. And it's true, we all have a lot of living to do. Life is short, don't waste it. Make sure you spend plenty of time with your friends and family this holiday season. And we'll see you around at a club near you or at www.deannaandthedownbeats.com. Thanks. right for some kissing and I mean to kiss me a few who oh, those guys don't know what they're missing there's such a lot of loving to do and there's wine all ready for tasting and there's Cadillacs all shiny and new gotta move cause time is all wasted opportunity to uh, introduce the fantastic downbeats this afternoon on piano, Ms. Kathy James. On the bass today, Mr. Steve Morelli. Keeping us in time, Mr. Fred Ingram on the drums. And sharing the trumpet with us today, Mr. Justin Smith. I am Deanna Mayo, and we are Deanna and the Downbeats. Happy holidays to you and yours. There are boys just right for some kissing, and I mean to kiss me a few. Oh, those guys don't know what they're missing. There's such a lot of All ready for tasting And those Cadillacs All shiny and new Gotta move Cause time is a wasting There's such a lot of living To do There's music to play Places to go, people to see Everything to Deanna and the Downbeats. That was awesome. That was fantastic. Yeah. Now we've got a little change of pace. We're going to go ahead right over to the Literate Simpletons. Or not. Maybe we'll hang out here for a it's while. It's all very like pointing. It's good to see. There were a lot of pointing going like, on. Woo! 
Literate simpletons. Just, Go, oh, JP! Oh, oh, well, they some, like they needed a oh, camera. Yeah, I don't know What's why they needed a camera. What's up with these guys? Doesn't this web streaming yeah. stuff just work? It's like so magic. Magic. Next they're going to be asking for mics. Okay. And now, the literate simpletons! <laughs> oh, that worked. Good. <laughs> oh, dear. Don't you feel sheepish? Oh. <laughs> like this lamb, little lamb, slaughter. like many, many volunteers at 30 Hour Day, has been up all night doing this. It's not just Cammie and Rick, it is an entire army of people uh, focused on making this happen. So a quick round of applause, if you would, for the volunteers, the hosts, the space. Absolutely. All right, we are the Literate Simpletons. We are um, here to provide you with some spoken word entertainment. There's going to be some, some tweeting or some, some dramatic reading of tweets going on and also some regular old poetry. I'm JP at LawDuck on Twitter. Uh, Sarah Gilbert, Ed Baraski, and Kathleen McDade are joining me, and they are the readers. I'm merely the MC. But as MC, I thought I'd start out real quickly with a couple of Hannah Montana haiku. Um, the book is coming out from Chronicle Books, you know, very soon. Uh, not really, but it would be great if it did. Um, but anyway, so Hannah Montana haiku. Sweet niblets, Jackson. Mima's our new lunch lady. How hilarious. That's a good one. <laughs> Lily's poor and stuff. I paid her way to D.C. Eek! White House Press Corps! And one last. Uh, Lolliver Drama! The L Word! No, not that one, you Gen X perverts. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, our first reader, yes, <laughs> courtesy applause from somewhere. Our first reader is Kathleen McDade. She is going to start out, I believe, with some tweets about burritos. This is true. And then and then move on to some poetry. So Kathleen. Thank you. Um, I'm at K McDade on Twitter, and you can also find me at TechnoEarthMama.com. Um, I'm going to be reading tweets about burritos. And first, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Melissa Lyon. Um, I don't know that she's the first person to come up with the idea of interpretive readings of tweets, but she did organize a little occasional event where people do that. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to Melissa Lyon, thank you. So here we go with burritos. Hey, Dr. Burrito, what's in that Speedo? Hmm, must get burrito. On the road, and I have a burrito. Want a breakfast burrito with bacon, lots and lots of bacon. My mommy's about to make me a breakfast burrito. My mommy is greater than your mommy. <laughs> Last day working for the burrito man. Off to bigger and better burritos. And munching on a burrito. LOL. <laughs> Just smash this breakfast burrito and hash browns. I just puked out a $12 Chipotle burrito. Thinking I may have enjoyed eating that burrito last night a bit more if I didn't have to keep one eye closed while doing it. The lady at Chipotle winked at me and gave me an extra burrito. Should I be happy or scared? <laughs> And the last one is from our own Stephanie Strickland of KGW, who inspired this entire series of burrito tweets. And she says, oh, burrito coma, how you soothe me into this foggy existence, what with your carbohydrate muscles and starchy demeanor. <laughs> Thank you. Those are the burrito tweets. <laughs> Now, next up, we have Archie Interviews a Pharaoh, which is by Don Marquis, and we're going to hear more from Don Marquis when Ed gets started, and maybe he can say something more about that, but here we go. I'm Archie here. Boss, I went and interviewed the mummy of the Egyptian pharaoh in the Metropolitan Museum, as you bade me to do. What ho, my regal leather face, says I. Greetings, little scatter-footed scarab, says he. Kingly has been, says I. What was your ambition 
when you had any? Insignificant and journalistic insect, says the royal crackling. In my tender prime, I was too dignified to have anything as vulgar as ambition. The rah-rah boys in the steady set were too haughty to be ambitious. We used to spend our time feeding the ibises, it's kind of like you, um, and ordering pyramids sent home to try on. But if I had my life to live over again, I would give dignity to the regal raz and hire myself out to work in a brewery. Old oh, tan and tarry, says I. I detect in your speech the overtones of melancholy. Yes, I am sad, says the majestic mackerel. I am as sad as the song of a Sudanese jackal who is waiting, wailing for the blood-red moon he cannot reach and rip. On what are you brooding with such a wistful wishfulness there in the silences? Confide in me, my imperial pretzel, says I. I brood on beer, my scampering whiffle snoot, on beer, says he. My sympathies are with your royal dryness, says I. My little pest, says he, you must be respectful in the presence of a mighty desolation. Little Archie, 40 centuries of thirst look down upon you. Oh, by Isis and by Osiris, says the princely raisin, and by Pish and Tush and Psa, by the sacred book Perumbru and all the gods that rule from the upper cataract of the Nile to the delta of the duodenum, I am dry. I am as dry as the next morning mouth of a dissipated desert, as dry as the hoofs of the camels of Timbuktu. Little fussy face, I am as dry as the heart of a sandstorm at high noon in hell. I have been lying here and there for 4,000 years with silicon in my esophagus as gravel in my gizzard. Thinking, thinking, thinking of beer. Divine drought, says I, imperial fritter, continue to think. There is no law against that in this country, old salt codfish, if you keep quiet about it, not yet. What country is this, asks the poor prune. My reverend juicelessness, this is a beerless country, says I. Well, well, said the royal desiccation. My political opponents back home always maintained that I would wind up in hell, and it seems they had the right dope. And with these hopeless words, the unfortunate residuum gave a great cough of despair and turned to dust and debris right in my face, it being the only time I ever actually saw anybody put the cough into sarcophagus. Dear boss, as I scurry about, I hear of a great many tragedies in our mists. Personally, I yearn for some dear friend to pass over and leave to me a boot legacy. Yours for the second coming of Gumbrinus, Archie. All right. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Next up is Ed Baraski, and Ed, I think it would be apropos if we heard a little bit more about Don Marquis before you got started. Okay, um, this is for all you American lit teachers out there. Uh, Don Marquis was a columnist and uh, journalist, uh, worked for a New York newspaper. Uh, at one point, uh, he came up with Archie, who was a cockroach, uh, who was actually a transmigrated soul of a free verse poet. And because Archie couldn't operate the shift key and hit a letter, all of Archie's poetry was in lower case, and he couldn't hit any of the punctuation marks. Uh, so if you actually look at one of these on a printed page, it's all lower case. So that's it. And your first poem is? Uh, Mehitabella and her kittens. Well, boss, Mehitabella the cat has reappeared in her old haunts with a flock of kittens. Three of them this time. Archie, she says to me yesterday, the life of a female artist is continually hampered.
I've done to deserve all these kittens. I look back on my life and it seems to me to be just one damn kitten after another. I'm a dancer, Archie, and my only prayer is to be allowed to give my best to my art. But just as I feel I am succeeding in my life work, along comes another batch of these damn kittens. It is not, Archie, that I am shy on mother love. God knows I care for the sweet little things. Curse them. But, but am I never to be allowed to live my own life? I have purposely avoided matrimony in the interests of the higher life, but I might just as well have been a domestic slave for all the freedom I have gained. I hope none of them gets run over by an automobile. M my heart would bleed if anything happened to them and I found it out. But it isn't fair, Archie, it isn't fair. Th these damn tomcats have all the fun and freedom. I if I was like some of these green-eyed feline vamps, I know I would simply walk out on the bunch of them and let them shift for themselves. B but I am not that kind. Archie, I am full of mother love. My kindness has always been my curse. A tender heart is the cross I bear. Self-sacrifice always and forever is my motto. Damn them. I will make a home for the sweet, innocent little things. Unless, of course, providence in his wisdom should remove them. They're living just now in an abandoned garbage can just behind a made-over stable in Greenwich Village. And if it rained into the can before I could get back and rescue them, I'm afraid the little deers might drown. It, it makes me shudder just to think of it. Of course, if I were a family cat, they would probably be drowned anyhow. Sometimes I think the kinder thing would be for me to carry the sweet little things over to the river and drop them in myself. But a mother's love, Archie, is so unreasonable. Something always prevents me. These terrible conflicts are always presenting themselves to an artist. The eternal struggle between art and life, Archie, is something fierce. My, what a dramatic life I have lived. One moment up, the next moment down again, but always gay, Archie, always gay. And always the lady, too, in spite of hell. Well, boss, it will be interesting to note just how Mahitabo works out her present problem. A dark mystery still broods over the manner in which the former family of three kittens disappeared. One day she was talking to me of the kittens, and the next day when I asked her about them, she said innocently, What kittens? Interrogation point. And that was all I could ever get out of her. We had a heavy rain right after she spoke to me, but probably that garbage can leaks, so the kittens have not yet drowned. Archie. The next one is Freddy the Rat Perishes. Listen, there have been some doings here since uh, last I wrote. There's been a battle behind that rusty typewriter cover in the corner. You remember Freddy the Rat? Well, Freddy is no more, but he died game. The other day, a stranger with a lot of legs came into our little circle. Tough-looking kid he was with a bad eye. Who are you? said a thousand legs. If I bite you once, said the stranger, you won't ask again. <laughs> you little poison punk, said the thousand legs. Who gave you hydrophobia? I got it by biting myself, said the stranger. I'm bad. Keep away from me. Where I step, a weed die. If I was to walk on your forehead, it would raise measles, and if you give me any lip, I'll do it. They mixed it then, and a thousand legs succumbed. Well, we found out this fellow was a tarantula. He, he had come up from South America in a bunch of bananas. For days he bossed us. Life was not worth living. He would stand in the middle of the floor and taunt us. Ha-ha, <laughs> he would say, where I step, a weed dies. Do you want any of my game? I was raised on red pepper and blood. 
I am so hot, if you scratch me, I will light like a match. You better dodge me when I'm feeling mean, and I don't feel any other way. I was nursed on a Tabasco bottle. If I was to slap your wrist in kindness, you would boil over with, like Job. And heaven help you if I get angry. Give me room, I feel a wicked spell coming on. Last night he made a break at Freddy the Rat. Keep your distance, little one, said Freddy. I'm not feeling well myself. Somebody poisoned some cheese for me. I'm as full of death as a drugstore. I feel that I'm going to die anyhow. Come on, little torpedo. Don't stop to visit and search. Then they went at it, and both are no more. Please throw a late edition on the floor. I, I want to keep up with China. We dropped Freddy off the fire escape into the alley with military honors. Archie. And last, the flattered lightning bug. A lightning bug got in here the other night. A regular hit from the country. He was awful proud of himself. You city insects may think you are some pumpkins, but I don't see any of you flashing in the dark like we do in the country. All right, go to it, says I. The head of a cat and that green spider who lives in your locker and two or three cockroach friends of mine and a friendly rat all gathered around and urged him on. And he lightened and lightened and lightened. You don't see anything like this in town often, he said. Go to it, we told him. It's a real treat to us. And we nicknamed them Broadway, which pleased them. This is the life, he said. All I need is a harbor under me to be a statue of liberty. And he got so vain of himself, I had to take him down a peg. You've made lightning for two hours, little bug, I told him. But I don't hear any claps of thunder. Yes, there are some men like that. Lenny he wore himself out and hit a bell the cat ate him. Archie. Uh, particularly grim. Uh, our last reader is Sarah Gilbert. Uh, Sarah is going to read Weather Tweets. And she is at Sarah Gilbert on Twitter. And... I'm going to let you say the name of your blog because I have just spaced it. Cafe Mama. Cafe Mama dot com. <laughs> um, we're, we're blessed in Portland to have a number of um, weather types that actually tweet. Um, and not only that, you know, we do have this citizen led Twitter storm team, which is um, pro probably the only one in the country. Um, so you can just skip the news and go straight to the straight to Twitter for your information. And some of the weathers are very poetic. Um, and for reasons that are unknown, I have mostly picked fog. So mm -hmm. <laughs> starting with um, Portland snow, December 8th, 2008. This cold winter night, that old wooden head Buddha would make a nice fire. Portland fog, January 12th. Fingers flicking across rooftops through the edges of bare branches, hushing Monday's noise. Portland fog, January 13. I am your echo, crows cawing, garbage trucks surging, birds singing hello to breakfast, one lone basketball bouncing in the cold. Portland fog, January 14. Sweeping into Portland nighttime, sponging the flood of street lights, making murmurs carry roundly, misty, mystic, me. Portland fog, January 15. The pink is not pink, no, it is the very fire itself, hot coals, the sunset's clouds, harbinger of my coming in the night. Wake up to me, PDX. Portland fog, January 17. Sleeping back into the river, Willamette, divider, conduit, orotin progress of awful, 
my pillow blanket birthing bar until the night. Portland rain, January 18. Portland, Oregon, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain, where voodoo treats can sure smell sweet when the wind comes right behind my rain. Portland fog, January 24. Freezing fog, they say, I prefer heaviness of cold, damply lit by head headlights, portent of at Portland snow, pillowing down sidewalks and avenues. Portland fog, January 28th. Today I have tumbled in love, trees tallest, space between piney branches, apples sodden with spoil, a runner's slow breath bellowing to me. Portland fog, January 29th. I surround you, caressing, commuters stamping onto the number 14, children darting before the bell, the steam from first cups of coffee, Portland. Raven me, January 29th. Thick tonight at Portland Fog. What are you obscuring? Portland Fog, January 29th in reply. At Raven Me, how can I speak of it? It is my gift, a shroud. With my multitudes, I swathe lovers, criminals, the lonely in search of space to cry. Portland Fog, January 30th. I'll be here all night if you should wake to me. Whisper, I am listening with a hundred thousand ears. Portland Fog, January 30th. Weeping through morning, you come to me, walking, driving, biking. I fold you in my arms and sob my chilling comfort. Portland Fog, January 31st. I see you morning and I raise you. My marks stippled on car hoods, chain link fences, chicken coops, apple branches ponderous with moss. Oleoptine, January 31st. Tardy apostrophe O oh, at Portland Fog. Your whiteness in morning's muted brightness befuddles me like old-fashioned glamour. Sudden blue stuns me. Parent hacks, January 31st. Making oatmeal chocolate chip cookies with my daughter. Fire going, mom visiting, deep sense of right. Portland fog, January 31st. The day had me bleary, spent of night, night and noontime, immersed in you, Portland, but now I lift my concourses. We pour, rush, spate, we thrill. Portland Fog, February 1st. Weary, bleary, gray-eyed from a night, I am spent tamping, dark dampening jet wings, control towers, traffic lights. I ponder on rooftops, sigh. Portland Fog, February 3rd. I murmur at your corners, Portland, tracing my pashmina sigh in your western hills, your Tabor mountain, slipping into either, oh, adieu. Portland fog, February 8th. 6 a.m., highlights paint filmy tracks on your wall. Open your eyes, it is I, gossamery, whitely countering the brilliant midnight moon. Wake to me. London theater, February 11th. How unfortunate that the Earth only has a single moon. Imagine the night sky if we'd popped up a couple of million light years to the left. Portland fog, February 13th. Weighted earthward by the chill, my minions sponge through pine needles, space blanking, weeping up quiet hills like slow, heavy bicycles. Portland fog, February 14th. Soundless in the night, I unfold you, lovers aching with passion or the tedium of ceremony, the lonely who insists solitude is better, really. Portland Fog, February 27th. I blew it all in the pre-dawn freeze, lifted my huddled hoop skirts, swishing through Portland silently, lusty ghosts prickling forearms primly. Portland Fog, March 6th. Memories of nighttime, slipping down cold, still streets, peeking in dark-lit windows, slinking in doors of empty cafes, a census of solitude. Portland Fog, March 6th. Creeping, sweeping, crawling up from steel-orange skies, all is blush and blue and black, and soon I mush Portland's Friday to gray. Ah. Uh, Rebecca Coffey, April 2nd. 
Ryan Cascade's visceral detail to create clarity as intense as the yellow-tinged brilliance before a terrible storm. Portland Fog, April 16th. Wake up, wake up. This, this a.m. I bring brightness in my midst, wiping off cold of March, bursting April word, murmuring red to tulips, lettuces. Portland Fog, May 13th. Duet. At Portland Rain and I, I playing the Swifty Brooder, fingering down to hills, licking toward river, bridge, bicyclists yellow clad and gray. Portland Thunder, June 4th. Not waiting for anything, I, I chase dogs under chairs, shut windows with a clatter, rock hearts to the backs of their holdings. I come. Portland Thunder, an hour later. I cannot bow out, cannot thank you. I am off, stunning, and then I decamp from Portland. I abscond with my clangor until when? Goodbye. Portland Fog, June 9th. I paint the moon into cream white on my palette. I swirl ochre, pewter, cadmium, my brush strokes thick. This moon deserves my full artistry. Portland Fog, July 5th. Reflecting on last night's glowering over big yellow moon, full of gunpowder and fire, swinging Tarzan-like through PDX with ripe fruit smoke. Portland Fog, September 18th. Have you seen me, city? Back in the pitchy mystery of small hours, I close creep, lighting my legion on your fig trees, your fallen seed pods. Jana K, September 18th. Horses snuffling around the paddock this morning in the fog, and the mountain was sparkling blue with a cap of fog like a bamboo hat. Portland Fog, October 19th. You may be wise, but did you know that I would touch paintbrush to tongue, stroke trees with my glow, persimmon and emerald, and oh, gold. Portland Fog, October 22nd. Recasting your grays as whites, I lie with your many-colored spandrels, sunbursts, your paper doll banisters. I lurk with broken pears and walnut holes. Portland Fog, November 1st. Heavy as a parent's head, I wander, trailing over molded skulls, wisps of cotton webs, licking 1,000 lips, trinking, tripping blankly around tombstones. Portland Fog, November 5th. Just enough today to brighten the last chance morning sun, to glean cold off fresh turned dirt, earthy potato bounty, to lift breath to sky. Portland Fog, December 13th. Ice, ice sh shatters silently in your pines, your figs frozen on ends of naked branches. I whisper a hibernal hurrah, morning snow that was not. That's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Sarah and Ed and Kathleen. And again, uh, I believe we have a comatose lamb. Uh, we're just going to leave her on the small stage. Um, but thank you again to the volunteers as well. And I think we are throwing it to Mike and Cammie. <laughs> Thank you to those folks with that uh, homage to Twitter. That was that was great. Appreciate that. Um, we are.
getting ready to do another spoken word thing, and the mystery spoken word group's name is the Random the Players. The Random Players. That Over was to right. them. If we had if we had placed money on that, I would have been yeah. right. Well, you usually Accurate. are. You should bet more often. Accurate. I shouldn't. Oh, are we? Yeah. There we go. Oh, we're ready to go. Take it, guys. Go. The following program is brought to you by the United States Department of Change. Change. If you're not surfing the wave, you're beneath it. <laughs> Hi, folks. Welcome to Louie and Shug's segment of the 300-hour uh, day. Day 11 Ultra Podcast. I'm Shug. Oh, <laughs> and I'm Louie. Gosh, 11 days? I think I really need a shower. Yeah, I'll bet the uh, ladies feel that way, too. <laughs> anyway, fundraising's been going on for, what, now, uh, 240 hours? Uh, Louis here has been keeping his own tally of the contributions. How's that total looking, Louis? Uh, we're up to 42 bucks plus three offers to work on the website. Okay, $42. Uh, well, if that ain't the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It's this economy, Shug. Nobody's spending a dime. Everyone's too pinched to contribute. How many people do you know that are underemployed? Well, there's... there's... Uh, everybody? Exactly. Low-paid jobs mean low incomes. Low incomes means low outgo. It's the curse of double-digit unemployment, Shug. Oh, <laughs> maybe Chicken Little was right. The sky is falling. By the way, folks, if you haven't figured it out, uh, you're tuned into Radio for TV. We're the Random Players, and today's show is called Fun Employment. The Random Players, for all your Radio for TV needs. The Random Players are available for your next online fundraiser. Tweet us today. If I only had a okay, okay, you promised not to sing, all right? Sorry. Anyway, it's time we get off with the show. Ready, Shug, girls? The Random Players present Fun Employment. Since the invention of the job, man has had something new to lose. Throughout modern history, the specter of unemployment has periodically raised its head above the cultural landscape. Times are tough these days, too. Lost your job? Yeah, we know. It's an old story. How old? Let's check it out. Yes, yeah, it's about time we got on with the show. Sorry. Ready, Louie? Random Players presents Fun Employment and a One and a Two. Not Willie's Day. In merry old England, for example, the play was the thing, except when it wasn't. <laughs> Verily, this my latest tragedy is a play superb. I am assured that it will play the boards the world o'er. Tis only needful for me to show it to my agent. Mm -hmm. Well, a nice play you got here, Will. Too bad it'll never be produced. Can't be produced? It sounds speaks so barely. Well, the script market is dead these days, Will. Nobody's buying new dramas anymore. It's all Punch and Judy shows now. You know, no actors, just puppets. Yeah, they don't even need scripts. They just throw in a lot of gratuitous sex and violence. But am I not William Shakespeare, England's greatest playwright? Dost thou not recall my triumphs at the Globe Theatre? Oh, yeah, about the theatre, yes, Will. Yes. Um, it, uh, the Globe burnt down last week. Tis not to be thought of. Well, the owners let the night watchman go. You know, budget cuts. So then a bunch of unemployed actors start a squatting backstage, and, well, you know how they are. But let the night watchman go. Oh, staff reductions, Willie. Why, half of London's out of work. The whole entertainment industry is in the doldrums. Me think the Lord's doth downsize too much. Ah, oh, unemployment. It can happen to anyone, even the best. You think we'd be doing this if we had jobs? Historically, unemployment has always been seen as something to avoid. It doesn't matter what line of work you're in. Hark <laughs> me, now you walk the plank. Oh, but Coppernook, sir, I be your first matey, your second in command. <laughs> That's, you're getting too long in the tooth, Shmi. Oh. Experienced hands like you are just too expensive to keep around. Oh. I be outsourcing my crew overseas. Har, oh. you're crocodile food now. Oh, oh. no, no. Off oh, you go. Even in the frontier days of the American West, lack of employment, was considered a problem. People came up with novel ways to cope, though some of them were uh, a little ahead of their time. Whoa, there, big fella, whoa. Say, partner, what's that sign you're holding up? I never did learn to read. Uh, it says, uh, we'll work for food, anything helps. You ever punch cows, hop along? 
Oh, my ma told me it weren't polite to hurt on poor dumb animals. Well, ain't no call for cowpokes these days anyway. Whole market shot the hell. What else can you do? Well, uh, I can code in XML and Perl. <laughs> that ain't real work. You don't look like you ever worked a day in your life. Why should I give you a handout? Well, uh, uh, oh, I can tend bar, too, from either side. Ain't no bars close from El Paso where I'm headed. That's another three days' ride from here. Well, hot diggity. I'm a headed west. Uh, say there, how about a lift, stranger? After just a week of homelessness, I no longer resemble a regular person. I'm dirty, damp, ill-dressed, and cold. I also seem to have become invisible. I don't panhandle, but when people walk by me, they are very carefully looking past me. It's like leprosy. Sheila A., October 2009. We'll work for food. House foreclosed with two kids and a dog. Outside since July. Anything helps. God bless. Sign held on a street corner by suited man, September 2009. I've been one paycheck away from losing my apartment for the last year or so. <clears throat> my baby and I have a good but a simple life. Every time my apartment manager speaks to me, my heart races for fear of this being my last week. Latresse L., July 2009. After a while, I don't know, it's not so bad. Maybe I'm just used to it. If you know where to look or places you can get a free or a cheap meal, especially if you don't mind some Jesus talk, clothes and a shower is nice. If I got to be homeless, I'm glad I'm in America. Don R., August 2009. I am not one of those shopping cart people. I have a car. I can. I take care to dress well. This is just temporary. I'm on Monster.com and Django and a whole bunch of other sites, too. Look, I have an MBA, six years of uninterrupted work since graduating, the best references. So far, I've been able to keep my membership at the gym so I can go and shower every day. I haven't told my parents I sleep in the car, which is kind of scary because I have to park in some places that are remote and somebody could see in. At least I'm losing weight. Daniel K. July 2009. Dear sir, I can work any hours at any rate you want. I know I am overqualified for this position, but my work history is very sound and I am desperate to do anything you need for that paycheck. From an answer to a job posting, April 2009. Hi, I'm 27 and as you can see by my picture, I am really cute. <laughs> I'm in school here in town, but um, I'm staying on couches right now. And what I'd really like is one nice man to maybe share an apartment with. I can make your life sweet. I have all kinds of skills, and I'll use them to make you very, very happy. Age, race, unimportant, but a kind heart and generosity is what I hope for. From a Craigslist personnel's ad, August 2009. The following news program is being underwritten by the United States Department of Change. Change. If you're not ahead of the curve, you just struck out. Nobody denies that losing your job can be a drag. It always has been. Take the Great Depression. What must unemployment have been like back then? Well, to find out, we sent our temporal reporter, Leslie Warbucks, back in time exactly 80 years to December 1929 for an exclusive report. I'm here in Washington, D.C. on December 3, 1929. Today, U.S. President Herbert Hoover announced to the U.S. Congress that the worst effects of the Black Friday stock market crash are, for the most part, behind the nation. His message, the American people have regained faith in the national economy. Good times are just around the corner, but are they really? I went out into the streets to talk with those most affected by the current 29 economic slowdown. I'm standing here in a soup line with recently unemployed Miss Celia Blank, just one of hundreds on this frigid morning. Celia, what was your job before you were let go? I was a bank teller. I worked at the bank for seven years. And bank teller position pay in 1929 was? I was receiving $180 a month. $180 a month, and you were able to live on that amount? Oh, yes. My apartment had steam heat and also electric lights, and all for $45 a month. I had saved up $500, which I kept in the bank where I worked. Why did you lose your job? The bank closed. Uh, failed. I uh, went to work like always, and the doors were locked. Uh, it was bedlam, a big crowd shouting, but no one could get their money. And now all I had saved is gone. And where are you living now? 
I have no home now. I sleep in parlors of friends, on their sofas. Celia, what do you think the future holds? Will things get better soon? The president says things are getting better, but I don't see it. Good luck, Celia. Celia's is a sad and all too common story in the wake of the mammoth economic turndown of 1929, but is it the whole story? Might there also be some bright spots in this otherwise bleak scene? Well, I found one when I interviewed Dr. Richard Drew, an engineer for the 3M company. Richard, what do you have there? This is my new invention, Perry. I call it scotch tape. Scotch tape, you say? Think it might catch on? Turns out to have a number of uses. Well, how did you come up with the idea? I was testing sandpaper, actually, and I noticed how hard it was for automobile painters to make clean dividing lines between different colors. That's why I invented my first masking tape. From that point, it was only a matter of refinement to make that tape invisibly clear and thin. That's what scotch tape is. How has the success of scotch tape affected your life here at the beginning? of the Great Depression. I assure you, Perry, there's nothing depressing about it. I believe that our modern advances, the pace of which is constantly accelerating, will improve everyone's lives in ways large and small. But for me personally, success has meant that I have more time to play my banjo. So you think the future looks bright in December 1929? I expect I shall require shades upon my spectacles. Well, it's fair to say that Celia's and Robert's views represent two emotional extremes here in 1929. But for most folks, reality falls somewhere in between. Opportunities may be few here at the beginning of the Great Depression, but even so, it's still possible to imagine a brighter future. Back to you in, 19, in 2009. Sorry. <laughs> Back to you. And that's our report for the past from 1929. From a time when working 50 hours a week in a factory for $200 a month was considered a good job. And unemployment insurance was a spot in a soup line. They took the oldest employees for full time and they put the rest of us on what they called a roster. If you expected to work in a short time, you wouldn't leave the house. You'd stay close to the phone because if you missed a call, you wouldn't be the next one called. You'd be waiting until your name came up again. Marie J, 1929. Well, we as kids didn't really understand it all. Uh, we were lucky. We lived in a house that we owned because it had been grandpa's. So we were all there with my brothers and my sister and me. And Mama would send us down to the line where they ladled out soup and handed out bread. We were so innocent at first. You see, people didn't cuss so much back then as they do now, but my older brother got a mouth on him in that soup line, let me tell you. We'd get up there and this guy would just put in the dipper and fill the pot Mama sent, but he'd just give us mostly broth. That's how my brother learned to cuss. He'd say, deep, dip, deep, damn you, <laughs> to the man. So we'd get some vegetables and maybe a little meat in that dipper. We had love, though, and that really helps you get by. Opal D, 1929. We got to see the musician fella come through the camp we were staying in. Radio called him the Dust Bowl Troubadour. He sang about what we were all going through, and he sang for free. Free is good when all your pockets are slack. I liked him, though my dad said he was a union agitator. I didn't know what they meant, but I liked his singing. Mr. Guthrie was a working man's friend, or maybe I should say a workless man's friend. That next week, three of us kids would all use this one old guitar was missing a D string. We'd bang out some of what we had heard. None of us were any good, but it was fun. It took your mind off how empty your belly could feel. Roger S., 1932. You had to be creative when it came to cooking. There were these folks from way back in the hills that ran hogs through the woods and would sell you some bacon or soft pork for not too much money. Mom and I would fry that up and set it aside and then pour cornmeal or maybe some flour into that fat left over and shape it up into cakes that we could cook. It wasn't much good, but appetite overcomes such. My little brother and I would go out picking poke salad. That's just any greens you can pick up and put in a bag. Dandelion, plantain. There were a lot of wild greens if you knew where to look. Jeanette P., 1929. I swear I did whatever came to hand. I picked apples in Washington, cabbage in California. I got some time in the mines in Anaconda, some work on the railroad in Nevada. When they was building a new line, I worked cattle in Oklahoma and dropped trees in California. I'd ride home to Mama, tell her rosy stories of how my life was working, but I couldn't tell her about riding the rails, having to defend myself against bummers and drugs, people that lost all respect. David W., 1932. With the invention of television, anyone could turn a knob and tune into the daily lives of Mr. and Mrs. Everyman. Turns out their problems were just like ours. 
The following program is brought to you by a generous grant from Studebaker. Studebaker, the car of tomorrow. Live the American dream from behind the wheel of your new Studebaker automobile. Oh, Ralph, you're home. Going bowling with Norton tonight? He was just looking for you. No, I ain't going bowling, Alice. I ain't going bowling this week, and I ain't going bowling next week. I ain't going bowling, period. Why, Ralph, whatever's gotten into you? I'll tell you what's gotten into me, Alice. I'll tell you what's gotten into me. That stinking bum of a bus line owner, Mr. Foreman's, what's gotten into me? He asked me to turn in my uniform. Said I was done driving one of his buses. Oh, Ralph. Oh, uh, nine years, Alice. Nine long years I've been driving that bus. With never an accident, nine years. Getting up in the dark, going out all kinds of weather, heat waves. Those were the best nine years of my life. Well, you'll get another job in no time. Uh, you think so, huh, Alice? Well, let me tell you, I read through the want ads on my way home to work today. Read them all the way through. But the bus station is only a five-minute bus ride from here. Yeah, that's right, Alice. That's all it took to get all the way through those want ads. All the way through, just like me. Well, what did you find? <sighs> Alice, there ain't no bus driving jobs in this city. There ain't no delivery driver jobs. There ain't no taxi driver jobs. That has a steering wheel, Alice, some other nuts already sitting behind it. Well, maybe you're going to have to try something besides driving, Ralph. Oh, sure, Alice. Like I know how to do anything else. It's not like I had a lot of education when I was growing up. I quit school after the sixth grade. Yeah, right after you got your driver's license. I was just a kid. Ah, oh, the kids. I'm going to miss them the most. I knew them all. I make sure they didn't forget their homework. I'd swap jokes with them. Sometimes I'd even get one of them up front with me and show them how to drive the bus. Hey, I bet one of those darn kids took my job. Now, Ralph. Oh, that dirty bum, Mr. Foreman. He had no right to take my job away. It was the best driver he had. Boy, oh, I ought to... Ralph, what are we going to do? Uh, well, we're just going to have to live in our savings, Alice. Okay, well, that takes care of tonight. What about tomorrow? Oh, it's no use, Alice. I'm washed up. Thrown out like a dirty oil rag. There ain't no jobs out there for a guy like me. The following program has been rated R for graphic reality by the United States Department of Change. Change? Really? It's a good thing. Okay, it's tough. I get that. You know, a year ago, I'd never considered food stamps. and I was embarrassed when I got in my car going through the line. I'd look and make sure there was nothing that looked frivolous. I didn't want the checker to think bad of me. The funny thing is that so many people with those cards, it hardly matters. Nobody else cares that you're on the card. And since I got so little to do, I wait to hear about work. I pulled out that old guitar, the one I didn't sell. I started playing to myself for a while, and sometimes I have a friend over to jam. It, it's getting kind of good. We've been thinking of playing out. And next week, for sure, we're going to go out busking. Who cares if we get anything in the hat? Something to do, and you may as well have fun. Donnie G, May 2009. I've been sitting around too much. 20 hours a week of work is not enough, but... At least I have a job. To keep myself distracted, I started knitting and crocheting. I made myself some gloves and a hat, and my pal from work liked them a lot. So he asked him where they came from, and I told her that I made them myself. I told her that if she brought the yarn, I'd make her some too. Well, she bought me enough yarn for some, from some liquidator store that I could wake, make way more than just bits now and then. And now I've made over 30 items, and I've sold them. After a couple of weeks, I was knitting, not because I was feeling useless, but because I was feeling creative and effective. I was actually making money. I feel like if they called me now to add more works to my week, I might turn them down. Yeah, I am certainly still poor, but it feels good. I feel like I'm really beginning to make things happen on my own. I always felt like the job was all that one could do, but I guess, gee, I, I guess I'm starting my own business. Even people I don't know want me to make things for them. People like being, like, like purchasing from a real person. And I'm learning to do my own books now. And everything. Annie Kay, November 2009. I moved home. I was so embarrassed to be back in my room. It still looked like it did when I was off to college. I felt so guilty. But I had been helping out, and I got a few hours down at the Starbucks. And it turns out mom and dad were kind of strapped themselves, so between working around the house and my little check, we are all getting by. It has allowed me to rethink my career. I've really sharpened up my resume, and because of this safety cushion, I'm working with a guy I used to do work with doing some software. We have made two iPhone apps, and one of them has been picked up 
by the Apple Store. I even uh, have taken some upgrade courses that are good for my work. I'm making myself more hireable. And when things are turning around, uh, till then it's just me and mom and dad. But hey, family is important, and we sometimes forget that in our rush to be achievers, I'm patient. I think the thaw is close. Last year at this time, I was making 100000 a year. I had lots of nice things, big screen, hot car. And I'm glad I bought all those things, since uh, it's nice to have now that I've been out of work nine months. So I went back to school. I wanted to feed my head. Going after a different degree has really been great. I'm chasing my interests now, rather than trying to advance my career. I'm studying what I wanted to study when I was a kid. No, it's not really valuable, but I am having a blast. I'm loving what I learned, and I am a way better student than I was back when I first went to school. I find myself asking, what the hell was I doing with my life? What a waste it was to be looking for more and more money, more and more work. Well, if I'm careful, I can make my savings last a while, and who knows? Maybe chasing my bliss is the right thing to do. I'm having more fun now than at any time in my life. Danny D, December 2009. Perhaps there are silver linings here. Maybe the market correction we've all been touched by was a true correction. Could the feeding frenzy of the last 15 years actually have been bad for our nation and for the world? Some say America's a giant spoiled brat, an economic bully, a fiscal hegemony grasping. Instead, amongst the sad tales and challenging days, Americans are doing what they often have, rising to the challenge, hatching new ideas, doing things because they're good to do for their own sake, not just for profit. The random players, radio theater on TV, ask you to take them bottles back, search the couch cushions, empty the change jar, and donate now. Donate the Oregon now. Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Free Geek are better places for that money than another pay-per-view movie or some imported donate. cheap holiday gift. If you're among those blessed with real employment, now is the time for you to get on board and share the wealth a bit. Show off how mighty your paycheck is. Impress the love of your life by proving the depth of her startling generosity. Money is like manure. It doesn't any good unless it's spread around. Let's feel some love. The preceding program was made possible by a generous grant from the United States Department of Change. Change, it's the one thing you can count on. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're gonna we're gonna stall a little bit.